Hello, my name is Frederick Ruberg from Boston University and Boston Medical Center, the Amyloidosis Center and the section of cardiovascular medicine. And today I'm going to be presenting a quick tip on the nomenclature and epidemiology of cardiac amyloidosis. Thank you very much for tuning in today. And over the next 10 minutes, we'll talk about cardiac amyloidosis as a protein folding disorder that's predominantly caused by either misfolded transthyretin protein or light chain. And T ATTR is the abbreviation for transthyretin protein and AL is the abbreviation for light chain amyloidosis. Cardiac amyloidosis causes symptoms of congestive heart failure and arrhythmia primarily, but many other symptoms as well, and we'll explore that. We'll discuss that AL amyloidosis epidemiologically is a rare disease, but ATTR amyloidosis is an emergingly recognized disease and is probably not as rare as we think it is. And finally, we'll talk about the clinical course and the prognosis of ATTR and AL amyloidosis and emphasize that early diagnosis remains absolutely essential and in specific populations that merit screening so that we can get patients the best possible care as early as possible when it's likely to be the most effective. So amyloidosis derives from the word amyloid, which actually derives from the Latin amylum, which means starch or starch-like. It was initially applied to human disease by the father of modern pathology, Rudolf Virchow, in the 1850s. Amyloid refers to a protein folding disorder. Initially, Dr. Virchow thought he was looking at a starch-like substance, but ultimately it was found to be protein. Um, and any protein that takes up a particular stain called Congo red and has a characteristic green biorefringence under polarized light microscopy is identified as amyloid histologically. Now, amyloidosis is the deposition of amyloid protein in the body. And the systemic amyloidoses, plural, are classified by the protein that misfolds. And as I mentioned, amyloidosis deposits all over the body, in the soft tissue, in the visceral organs, and in the peripheral nervous tissue, causing disease and dysfunction of those organs. The nomenclature is actually quite straightforward. A stands for amyloid, and then the protein that misfolds is abbreviated. So ATTR is transthyretin amyloidosis, for example. The major types of cardiac amyloidosis really are two. There's only two precursor proteins that cause the vast majority, well over 95% of cases of cardiac amyloidosis. There are, are other rare causes, things like gelsolin, for example, cardiomyopathy, but these are quite uncommon. And the most clinicians will really encounter one of two principal types. As I mentioned, TTR or transthyretin is also known as pre-albumin. And it's a protein that is secreted by the liver um, and under certain conditions, as we'll go over, misfolds into amyloid. ATTR is further subdivided into two types, a hereditary type, which we call ATTRV or hereditary amyloidosis, or the non-hereditary type, which we call wild type or uh, ATTR, or previously known as, sorry, senile cardiac or senile systemic amyloidosis. The term derives from the genetic uh, protein structure. Wild type is is genetically uh, normal, if you will, wild type, and the hereditary or variant results from single nucleotide poly polymorphisms in the TTR gene that, uh, that uh, precipitate uh, destabilization and misfolding. Now, as I mentioned, AL and ATTR amyloidosis both cause symptoms of congestive heart failure and arrhythmia, and those are the principal cardiovascular manifestations as illustrated here. Conduction block, um, dysrhythmias like atrial fibrillation, and symptoms of congestive heart failure, either right or left-sided and right-sided heart failure are the principal findings of cardiac amyloidosis. Now, systemic amyloidosis can cause many other, uh, many other uh, signs and symptoms. For example, hereditary amyloidosis commonly causes neuropathy. Um, neuropathy as manifesting as autonomic neuropathy in the form of orthostatic hypotension or peripheral neuropathy, sensory neuropathy primarily or gastrointestinal uh, disturbances also resulting from abnormal innervation of the gut, early satiety, diarrhea, constipation, and, uh, and weight loss. As I mentioned, the, poly the, uh, the sensory neuropathy seen in hereditary amyloidosis is, is one of the principal manifestations of disease, um, but soft tissue uh, involvement also predominates. So carpal tunnel syndrome, particularly bilateral carpal, bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome is quite common. And in ATTR amyloidosis, spinal stenosis also appears to be common, and tendinopathies, spontaneous tendon ruptures, are also uh, reported and are seen quite commonly in, in ATTR amyloidosis. Now, AL amyloidosis can cause many of these things as well, particularly a neuropathy with proteinuria from amyloid uh, uh, deposition in the kidney. And pathognomonically, um, the AL amyloidosis is recognized by the uh, 
macroglossia, as illustrated here, or periorbital ecchymosis, where bruising um, and, uh, and petechiae are seen around the eyes related to a small vessel uh, amyloid uh, uh, and infiltration and, um, and small vessel leakage. So these findings are really seen in AL amyloidosis and are not seen in ATTR amyloidosis. And it can be difficult to differentiate clinically between the two, which is why specific testing is necessary to evaluate both for AL and ATTR in a patient in whom you think has cardiac amyloidosis. Now, the epidemiology of amyloidosis, as I mentioned, is variable. AL amyloidosis, illustrated here, this is an, a, uh, an, an immunoglobulin, and this is the light chain part of the immunoglobulin that dissociates from the rest of the immunoglobulin and then misfolds to cause amyloidosis. This is a rare disease. We, now, we know from repeated, uh, repeated uh, population studies that the incidence is probably in the order of 1 to 50 and to 1 in 100,000, and which, which results basically in about 5,000 to 7,500 new cases diagnosed annually in the United States. Now contrast that with wild-type amyloidosis. This is a cartoon of the TTR tetramer showing its four identical subunits. TTR amyloidosis, particularly the wild type, may occur in up to 10% of older patients with heart failure. We don't know. Population studies are being performed presently in different populations, um, but it's been well described in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. It's also been well described in populations of patients with severe aortic stenosis. Again, somewhere in the order of 10% or maybe more of patients with those diseases also have unappreciated ATTR amyloidosis. So this translates into maybe over 100,000 cases or more in the United States that have yet to be diagnosed. And it's critical to identify these specific populations, older patients with heart failure, particularly heart failure with, I'd say, preserved or at least mid-range, uh, uh, mildly reduced ejection fraction. And severe aortic stenosis are two important populations to think about, at least for screening or uh, heightened awareness for cardiac amyloidosis. Now, the ATTR amyloidosis that causes this from hereditary disease is also extremely important and underappreciated. And the reason why is because these inherited alleles follow an autosomal dominant manner. So a parent has a 50% chance of passing to their children uh, the, the variant allele. There are over 100 different variants described in ATTR, and more than 30 um, are, are important in, uh, as causes of hereditary amyloidosis. And as I mentioned, the manifestations are cardiac or neurological or both. The most important allele by far is abbreviated V122I, also known as PV142I. It's the same allele. It occurs in 3.4% of African Americans, self-reported uh, Black people in the United States, um, but its penetrance is not known. It's clearly age-dependent, so as people live longer, the disease manifests, and ATTR V122I amyloidosis is definitely a disease of aging, but we don't know how many people who carry the allele will develop amyloidosis, and we don't know how many people, older uh, African American patients with heart failure, have ATTR amyloidosis as the cause of their heart failure. And these are important studies that are under, being undertaken at the present time. There may be 50 or 100,000 cases, we don't know, of undiagnosed ATTR amyloidosis. So it's really important to understand the disparity in, um, in, uh, in these different diseases. AL is very important, but unlikely to be encountered, whereas her ATTR amyloidosis is almost definitively going to be encountered in your common practice as a cardiologist. This slide illustrates the different pathos, pathways of AL and ATTR amyloidosis, focusing on AL. On the left of the slide, this nice figure um, uh, from a few years ago in Jack uh, by Sperry et al. demonstrates the liver, as I mentioned, uh, synthesizing the transthyretin, which then disaggregates and misfolds to form amyloid fibrils deposit in the heart. And in this case, they were looking at the carpal tunnel, an important study demonstrating the prevalence of ATTR amyloidosis by carpal tunnel sampling, about 10%. Another important cause of amyloidosis, as I mentioned, is AL. And in this case, the plasma cells in the bone marrow become clonally abnormal. They clonally proliferate and proliferate and elaborate a light chain that itself misfolds and causes amyloid. And in this case, also deposits in different parts of the body, including the carpal tunnel and in, more importantly, in the heart. And the slide at the right illustrates how these, these free light chains aggregate as amyloid fibrils in between cardiac myocytes. So they don't they don't uh, deposit in cells, they deposit outside of cells, and they increase the space in between cells, thereby increasing, increasing the extracellular compartment. Um, they also cause direct toxicity to myocytes, leading to myocardial necrosis, um, and, uh, and, and that can be manifest clinically by elevations in cardiac enzymes. So it's typical for patients with AL and ATTR amyloidosis to have elevation in their, in their cardiac troponins uh, as, as virtue by, by, by the result of the fact of the cell injury that results from the amyloid deposition.
It's important to recognize that the heart is the most important organ that's affected by AL amyloidosis and the most common organ affected in AL amyloidosis, maybe up to 85%, eight, at least 75 to 80% of cases. Now, as I mentioned, the transthyretin amyloidosis is a different, uh, a different uh, situation, where in this case, the, the abnormal protein, TTR, is produced by the liver. I didn't completely tell the truth. The TTR is also secreted by the choroid plexus and by the retina. So there are very rare uh, and, uh, inherited forms of amyloidosis, hereditary TTR amyloidosis that can cause retinal dysfunction, uh, vitreous uh, opacities, and normal pressure, normal pressure hydrocephalus in the CNS. But for for by and large, as a cardiologist, those are extremely uncommon and unlikely to be encountered. And ATTR amyloidosis caused by the common variants like V122I or wild-type disease is, are the most important uh, uh, entities. So as I mentioned, the TTR tetramer uh, misfolds and then, then, ag then uh, sorry, dissociates, then misfolds and then aggregates and causes the clinical manifestation of disease. Um, so, so as you can imagine that the treatment, uh, as we will speak of in, in, in a future uh, a quick tip presentation uh, recorded by my colleague, Dr. Maurer, will discuss how TTR amyloidosis could be addressed either through um, uh, liver synthesis or through stabilization of the protein. Now turning attention to prognosis. So as I mentioned, cardiac amyloidosis in AL is the most common organ of manifestation. It's also the most important in terms of determining prognosis. And we know that because the most commonly using stage, used staging system to identify prognosis in AL amyloidosis use, it utilizes cardiac biomarkers, specifically BNP or NT-proBNP or troponin I. And the two most commonly applied staging systems derive from these biomarkers. One uh, that was uh, originally reported um, in 2004 and then revised in 2012 uh, by our colleagues at Mayo Clinic. And the other recently reported um, from Boston University, my group, using different biomarkers uh, and different cut points. The general concept is that the higher the BNP and the higher the troponin, the worse the prognosis. And what you can see here in this slide, which illustrates the, the BU system, shows that patients who have BNP and troponin that are below the threshold, in this case, a BNP of 81 and a troponin of less than 0.1, um, these patients do exceptionally well over time, whereas as these numbers get higher, illustrating worsening cardiac involvement, the prognosis worsens. And those who have the worst prognosis, unfortunately, still experience the worst, uh, sorry, the worst biomarker elevation experience the worst prognosis. Many of you probably learned that cardiac amyloidosis is an untreatable disease, or at least it used to be an untreatable, um, with a, a survival of maybe six months to a year. And that is definitively not true except for the people who have the most advanced disease. We call those stage 3B patients. Patients who are in 3B, diagnosed late, unfortunately, still are looking at a median survival of about 50% at one year. These are people who have NT-proBNPs that are you know, many, many thousands, over 8,000, or BNPs that are 1,000, over 700 at least, um, and have high troponins. And the same thing is true with the Mayo Clinic, and they with this, their, their different designations, uh, different uh, species here, in, case, in this case, they use troponin T, uh, nt -pro -BNP, um, and the differential between the affected light chain and the unaffected light chain. But I wanna call your attention to how, pro how much progress has been made. When our colleagues at Mayo first reported their staging system using cardiac biomarkers in 04, survival was measured in months. Even stage one patients were looking at two-year survival. When we published our results last year, in, uh, two years ago, actually, um, the we're measuring survival in years. So patients who are stage one, ostensibly without significant cardiac involvement, they don't even reach median survival after 10 years of, of, of treatment, uh, of observation with modern contemporary treatments. Even those who are stage three, this group here, are still looking at a 50% survival of, I'm sorry, median survival of almost five years, four and a half to five years, which is dramatically different than, you know, three and a half months as it was just a short, you know, uh, 15 years ago. So things have changed really dramatically in AL amyloidosis, and they've also changed in ATTR amyloidosis. And these, this slide illustrates similar biomarker staging system for ATTR wild type and ATTR B122I amyloidosis in the absence of therapy. And this is what's important about this study. The, this, 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 uh, this important publication from our colleagues at the National Amyloidosis Center in London utilizes cut points. In this case, they use nt -pro -BNP and EGFR obviously a measure of renal function, which holistically assesses the degree of uh, insult to the, uh, to the homeostatic mechanism resulting from amyloidosis. And patients who are the, the, in the middle, these are stage two patients, have a median survival of about five years. And that's about the median survival for ATTR wild type amyloidosis. Earlier stage patients, 
have a median survival of maybe six years, uh, six to seven years, five to seven, me, and, and those who are diagnosed later, median survival of maybe three to five years. These are without treatment, and you will, as you will hear from another Quick Tips presentation, we now have treatments for this that can dramatically alter this curve. But I want to call your attention to the V122I curves here. This is the disease uh, caused by the allele most commonly observed in 3.4% of African Americans. The curves are shifted to the left, unfortunately, which indicates that even at a given degree of biomarker elevation, the survival is worse. And this we don't understand. Whether this has to do with systemic processes that lead to care disparities or inherent biological mechanisms um, that, that co-associate, we, we simply don't know. Um, it's, um, and so that is the subject of, of rich investigation as well, certainly uh, as a means to try to, you know, to try to understand whether there is a biological um, uh, underpinning that potentially could be, that could be contributing to, uh, to the worsening uh, uh, survival observed with V122I, and an, an important area of investigation that needs to be addressed. And finally, I would say that these curves do not illustrate treatments that are now available. So we can expect that for both of these types of amyloidosis, treatments will extend survival further, similarly as we have observed in AL amyloidosis. Great progress has been made uh, over uh, the short few years, um, I would say, in ATTR amyloidosis, when previously these, these uh, diseases were only treated by liver or heart transplantation. Uh, so with that, I hope that you've uh, you've learned something over the past uh, 10 minutes or so. Thank you very much for your attention.